Lecture number 18. Now, when you're reading through the second part of 2 Nephi, where all of that material on Isaiah is, you just can't possibly absorb it all. But there are some things that you should definitely be able to remember. There are the great prophecies of Isaiah about uh, the coming of the Messiah. You won't want to miss that. There are the great prophecies of Isaiah about the fall of the northern ten tribes. Uh, then, um, and who carried off the ten tribes, by the way? What was the name of that country? Who carried off the ten tribes? Assyria. You won't forget that, will you? And they had the ten tribes for a couple of hundred years. And, uh, excuse me, they had them for um, about a hundred years. And then Assyria got conquered. Who conquered Assyria? Babylon from down below. And then who conquered Jerusalem? Babylon did, that's right. And then you remember that the Jews were allowed to come back and do time and rebuild their temple and set it up again. Now, Isaiah spent an awful lot of time talking about America and the, and the last days. Did he know about the Indians? Did he know about Joseph Smith? Did he know about um, Martin Harris? Did he know about um, Charles Anson? Did he know about Brigham Young? Did he mention him specifically? No, that's right. That's clean thinking. I just want clean thinking out of you, that's all. Take the fuzziness out of it so that you know what he did and what he didn't do. All right, that's the way to talk about it. When Jacob started out his writings, he said, I'm not going to clutter up your minds with a lot of definitions. I'm just going to call which people Nephites? The righteous who supported Nephi. And who, who are the Lamanites? Yeah, he uses that name regardless of whether they... Uh, uh, their lineage. If there are Nephites that apostatize, he calls them Lamanites. If the Lamanites have become righteous, he calls them Nephites. So that's uh, just a definition that he inserts there. Then we have two or three statements in the Book of Mormon that are real classics. They are lacking in the Bible. For example, it's the Book of Mormon that says we are saved by grace after, after all we can do. Now that's a real classic statement because Many of the Christian churches teach that you are saved by grace and confessing the name of Jesus Christ regardless of what you do. This is not a f true doctrine. As James said, um, you believe in uh, Christ, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? See, that's in the Bible. But it's in the Book of Mormon that it says you are saved by grace after all you can do. Do you have it in your power to save yourself? Could you live so good that God would just have to take you back? Not without the... It's the atonement that makes it possible for all of our good works to be efficacious. Because our good works, unfortunately, are never perfect. We're in a school. We're learning all the time. So we make uh, blunders. We learn that 2 plus 2 is 4 because we wrote down 7 a couple of times and got 0, you see. And we get a scabby nose in life and get up and say, okay, I'll try to remember now. 2 plus 2 is 4. Now that's the, that's the way life is lived. And we're constantly making mistakes and we're constantly doing it too far this way. And then we swing this way. And only in our more mature years do we get into the groove that borders on perfection, though it never does quite achieve it. And just as you've overcome one thing, something else slips out of joint. You notice that? You got to have um, a spiritual chiropractor working on you all the time. That's what the Spirit of the Lord does. So always getting your, back, your joints back in where they belong. Now, I hope you can remember the parable of the olive tree uh, so that you'll remember that um, there were three transplants and uh, we know what a couple of them are. We can't figure out the third one. And what are the wild branches that were grafted in? Which Gentiles? There were lots of Gentiles. The Gentile Christians are the wild branches that were grafted in. They too eventually degenerated, but what did, at least did they save that helped the Lord restore the gospel? That root, and what did the root represent? The scriptures. And while they'd been distorted a little, it was the Bible that made it possible to lay a foundation and it's so much easier for us to convert those who have a knowledge of the gospel and to start from scratch. Uh, the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord just has to really pour into our brethren who are Buddhists, for example, or belong to some of the other religions. We have a very difficult time bridging. We have a lot of basic concepts we have to share before uh, the restored gospel makes sense to them. But 
Nevertheless, they're making it once the Spirit of the Lord enlightens them. But the Bible made it possible to, uh, for us to move much faster. It was in the days of um, Amalekai that the people became so wicked down here, this is about uh, 225 B.C., they became so wicked that the Lord raised up a prophet to lead the remnant of righteous Nephites out of the land. What was that prophet's name? Mosiah which? Go on. And he went over into this land, and you remember about the Mulekites. Where did they come from? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, about just after Lehi. And they had just had a man visit them in the last 25 years or so, who was from up north. What was his name? And he was of the... Jaredites. And where did the Jaredites come from? Tower of Babel area. That's right. This is just great, you see. Now, when you can respond like that, then you're on. Then I know you're getting it, because... It isn't what I teach you, it's what you take out of this class that's important. Now, um, uh, Mosiah was able to translate the rock that Coriantumr had written, and he did it by means of what? The interpreters or the Urim and Thummim. Then he had a son whose name was what? Benjamin. Benjamin. Righteous or wicked? Very righteous. Uh, did he ever have any wars? Yes, the Lamanites finally found their way through those great passes of the narrow strip of wilderness, swarmed down on them, and with what sword did Benjamin fight? The sword of Laban, that famous sword that still exists, the most famous sword in the world. And one day you'll see it and hold it in your hands. Not yet, but in due time. It's still in existence. And um, Benjamin then gave his very famous sermon and did a remarkable thing before his death. What was he, the, did the Lord allow him to do, which President McKay was not allowed to do? In his weakness and old age, he was allowed to delegate the prophetic calling, the presidency of the church, be king of the people and the historian of the people to his son three years before he died. Something that's very seldom allowed a prophet. He has to go right through the trauma of the catabolical processes even unto death still carrying the burden right to the end, as President McKay did. And God blessed him right to the end. He was just fabulous the way the Lord blessed President McKay. But Benjamin got that great privilege of bowing out a little early and letting young Mosiah the second take over. Now in the days of um, uh, he, about 200 B.C., there were a few of the Nephites that got homesick, homesick and nostalgic feelings about the old city of what? Lehi Nephi or Nephi as the case may be and they went back down there who was their leader? Uh, Zenith or Zenith um, what was the name of their first leader? that's right we don't know thank you that's the answer we don't know see that's what you ask yourself going through this book grab those names and if there isn't a name say hmm, there's no name so and there's no name now um, it's just like uh, the, the wife of uh, Isaiah we know her title but not her name what was her title? Prophetess, prophetess. Did she have any children? Yes, she had a couple of children. Uh, very important. Uh, okay, that's some. We don't know her name, however. Now, um, they went down this land southward, and uh, uh, Amalekai, uh, the prophet, uh, the writer Amalekai, had a brother go with uh, with them, uh, didn't he? Did you ever hear from him? No, he died without ever hearing whatever happened to them. But in the reign of King Mosiah the uh, second, the people became. They became anxious to have somebody go down. What was the name of the man that went down? Who went down to find out what had happened to the lost Nephites? What was his name? Ammon. Will you remember that? Ammon. And we have several Ammons in the Book of Mormon. This is the first one. Don't forget Ammon. We also have an Ammon who's the, um, uh, the sons of uh, King Mosiah. All right, this, is this Ammon a Nephite? Who's he descended of? Yeah, and he'd like to see what's south of the mountain, too. His people never been down there. Never saw what was south of the narrow strip of wilderness. Love to go on this trip. So he wants to go with Admiral Byrd on to the south uh, expedition down here, which he does. Excuse me, not Admiral Byrd. Uh, Ammon uh, wants to go down the south over the narrow strip of wilderness. Now he comes down there, and to his amazement, he rushes up to the first Nephite that he meets, and it turns out to be the king who's riding around the, uh, the city in his... Um, in his chariot, what happened to Ammon and his brethren? Yeah, they were captured and put incommunicado in prison, and uh, and the king finally let him out to talk, said, you are permitted to speak, and was Ammon insulted? 
He said, if you'd known who I was, you wouldn't have uh, done this to me. I've come out of Zarahemla to bring you greetings. And the king said, that's impossible. Because why? They are all dead. How did he know they were dead? Yeah, we found their bones. I sent up 43 men on an expedition to find you to rescue us from slavery. And when they came back, all they had were 24 gold plates we couldn't read. And there was nothing up there but bones of horses and men, etc. So uh, how could you be alive? Oh, Ammon says, you missed us. You got in the mountains and got lost and went way on around us and on up into the land northward. Those are Jaredites you saw. That's not us. We're very much alive. We filled the whole valley of Sidon. And so um, Lemai said, that's good. That's really good because we're in trouble. We are really in trouble. My father got us into the biggest mess you ever saw. As a matter of fact, I'll let you read the record of my grandfather Zenith, or Zenith, and you can see for yourself what's happened. Did Limhi call a conference right away of the people? Good news. He gathered them together and he postponed the good news right to the end of his big talk. You remember that? And he, he, he said, now you all remember what happened and how we, we sinned and my father sinned and uh, we got ourselves into um, slavery and bondage. We've been paying what, what in taxes? What's the taxes? 50%, you see, just about where we're getting again here in the United States. Won't be long. And uh, the, the strange thing is, uh, we can't say we're in bondage to a foreign power. Uh, that might be a fact of the matter if we knew all the ramifications of it. But anyway, uh, they are actually our own elected bureaucratic representatives that have uh, passed these laws. So you could, we could still unpass them. You couldn't meet in a legislative conference and change the uh, Lamanite taxation uh, rate, though, could you? Now, we could do that. We still have that power if our people just make up their minds that it could be done a better way. In any event, uh, Ammon sat down and began to read the book of Zenith or Zenith. Now, I think that's... Let me just uh, double-check here to see which is the preferred pronunciation because... Uh, uh, my, uh, I usually say Zenith, uh, and I heard uh, the recording, I listened to the cassettes on the way down each time, and I noticed he said Zenith. Let me just see if by any chance we've missed that. All of you know of the glossary, don't you, in the back of your book, on page 534, it says, says uh, Zenith is correct. It's Zenith, not Zenith. Okay, we'll say Zenith from now on. Right. That, that, actually, that is the Hebrew pronunciation. The pronunciation there in the back of your book is the Hebrew. And we anglicize them sometimes. And so as, as he sat down to read this book of Zenith, right, um, he, he read about how the grandfather of King Limhi had come down and he admitted he was overzealous to repossess the land after God had led a prophet out uh, he uh, wanted to come back. So he went with this first leader, and of course everybody was killed but 50, and they only took soldiers down the first time. The second time, what did they take? Yeah, Zenith, um, Zenith said, I saw this land. These people, they're these Lamanites. They, you can get along with them. They're nice, happy people, a little on the lazy side, but great people. We'll be able to negotiate a peace with them and have our beautiful city back with the temple that Nephi built. All of you come with your families. Let's go. So they did. And he went through the wilderness. Uh, they had a hard time again. He said there was much famine and everything. They got down there. Did King Laman negotiate with them? Yeah. Indeed he did. And so they took over the city of what? Yeah. Nephi or Lehi-Nephi and, uh, and Shilom or Shilom. Uh, the, your book says Shilom, so we'll pronounce it Shilom. Uh, but that means peace. And then the Lamanites moved their capital to where? Shemlon. 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 Are they far apart? No, you could build a tower here, you see, and see Shemlon. So it's not very far. Not very far. Now, you've got a passage in here which tells you something about Mosiah the First. When Mosiah the First was rendezvousing the righteous Lem Lem uh, Nephites about 225 B.C. to escape over the, into the wilderness, they used to meet where? Where did it say they used to meet? Just above this, the area here of Shemlon, right next to the city of Nephi. And there seems to have been a pass right up there because when Zenith and his people came out, where did they come out? Right above Shinem. Shinem, right above Shinem. 
Okay, any questions there? Okay. Now, as Ammon is reading this book of Zenith and all about the history of these people, he finds that they got along real good for about 12 years, but in the 13th year, King Laman said, and now we're going to enjoy your flocks and your crops. And he attacked. You remember about how many Lamanites got killed? About 3,000. About how many Nephites? Oh, a little over 200, yeah, a little over 200. And he said we were very sad about that. Lost about 200. Now, the Lamanites kept their place for 22 more years, and then King Laman died, and his son reigned, and then they had some more skirmishes, and nevertheless, they were able to hold them back, and finally, Zenith himself died. Then he had a son named Noah, and Noah changed everything. They've got peace, so he imposes a tax on the people just to support himself and his lecherous living. And what, how much of a tax just to support the king and his priests? One-fifth of everything everybody raised went just to the king to support his bureaucracy. Uh, as a matter of fact, he kicked out all of the priesthood that had been ordained by Zenith. And who ordained the new ones? Yeah, Noah said, I'm king. I'll... Did he have any authority to ordain them under these circumstances? Even if his father had ordained him, he had become an adulterer. He was immoral. He'd lost all priesthood. As it says uh, in the 122nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, or 121, um, when you are wicked, amen to the priesthood of that man, meaning you cut yourself off. Now, he set up these new priests. Yes? Abinadi? Now, now, we have no reference to the actual uh, ordination or raising up of Abinadi the prophet who suddenly appeared in their midst. Usually this is by direct um, um, uh, ministration of God. Now, the prophet Joseph Smith said all of the Old Testament prophets held the Melchizedek priesthood and were either ordained by someone having authority or were ordained by God. Now, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, King Noah. Okay, now, King Noah started using the money that he got um, not only to support his very uh, voluptuous living. He had all these wives and concubines. Is that an abomination of God? Well, he asked the prophets to do it. What's the difference? Yeah, one's to raise up seed unto God in righteousness. It's only permitted on specific commandment of the, of the Lord and under very restricted circumstances where very righteous people are able to do it. Uh, so this is an abomination. How about his priests? Same thing? Yeah, in addition to that, uh, they uh, uh, raised up harlots' houses in addition to wives and concubines, so they're a totally immoral people. And uh, just to get the people in on the act, what did uh, King Noah have them start planting in abundance? Yeah, grapes, 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 nice grapes. Just like, uh, let's see, what is in California uh, that raised so many grapes? Uh, San Joaquin Valley? San Joaquin? And I, did, I couldn't believe it on my last trip. I used to train the police departments down in San Joaquin, Bakersfield, Fresno, Merced, um, I was driving along here and I see all these great big huge oil tanks. So I said to my host, I've never seen oil tanks so close together. Usually they make them spread out and these are right one right next to another. Great big round huge oil tanks. He said, that's not oil. I said, what is it? He said, that's, those are wine. That's, that's wine. I said, you're kidding. Oh, he says, that's nothing. He said, there are only 15 or 16 of those. Um, down here we'll see 25 or 30 all lined up together. I said, you mean that's all full of wine? Yes, yeah, being aged. In steel, no less. Aged. I said, you mean we're guzzling wine in this country like we guzzle gasoline in our uh, big galloping um, dinosaurs? He <laughs> said, that's, that's the market right there. I said, no wonder Western Airlines just pours it into people's glasses and <laughs> tries to get them to drink it as fast as they will. We, we, we'll become a nation of guzzlers yet. Why knows? Well, in any event, he got them all going. Everybody got in on the act and the wickedness. Now, uh, did, he, um, did he make any fancy buildings? Any fancy buildings? Yeah. What did he do to the temple? Tear it down? Oh, no, you got to have the church. See, now this is typical of wicked men. On Christmas and Easter, you see, they go to church. Everything is elaborate and so forth. Everything's got to be ostentatious. And so forth. it's kind of interesting how wicked people uh, will devote 
fabulous amounts of money to um, build churches. Uh, for example, on Riverside Avenue, one of the most elaborate churches in New York, as, um, as you know, probably has been built by, the, it's the Riverside Church. And the speakers who are invited to that church sometime are those that represent the very worst of uh, anti-Christian, anti-American, uh, anti-freedom forces. And it's fascinating. I, I used to be on their mailing list and I would read this, this, the talks that were given by the enemies of everything that's decent and good in that church, built by some of the, one of the wealthiest families in the whole United States. It's kind of a strange uh, anomaly. All right, then in their midst there arises this prophet Abinadi, uh, no indication of anything except that the Lord had called him and raised him up. Do you have authority to go preach to the people if God just stands there and says, go? I'll, right? Now, at some time, he may ordain them right then. Have you, sort of, have you been ordained in a way just when you're sent by the Lord in open revelation? You've certainly been commissioned, haven't you? But the Lord calls, says that all these ancients were ordained. I was going to mention to you earlier, uh, if you trace the priesthood that Moses received, he got it through a Midianite named Jethro. And Jethro got it through his ancestors back to a man named Isaiah, who lived at the same time Abraham did, but he wasn't ordained by Abraham, and he wasn't ordained by Melchizedek. The 84th section says he was ordained by, by God and was blessed by Abraham later. Real interesting. And remember, if I ask you, did the prophets of the Old Testament hold the Aaronic or Melchizedek priesthood? We now know they all held the higher Melchizedek priesthood, which is the priesthood that opens the heavens for you to have visions, revelations, and to participate in the, the most important spiritual um, ordinances of the gospel. Now, um, Abinadi, were they pleased to have Abinadi warn them that some very serious things were going to happen to them? Now, as a matter of fact, they have flee for his life. How long was he gone? Now, when he came back, uh, how did he come? Disguised. But he did a, it's, it's, there's, there's some humor in the Book of Mormon if you look for it. Uh, Abinadi comes back, he's, he's, he's all disguised now. I didn't want him to recognize him from two years before. And he stands up in front of the people and he said, I bring you a message for God said unto me, Abinadi. <laughs> there it is, you see. Abinadi. And then it's all out. So he went ahead and gave his message anyway. He himself reveals who he was in that very first opening sentence. Comes in disguise and says, The Lord said to me, Abinadi. And he quoted it to them. So anyway, they can do a quick credit check on him, find out all about him, who he is, etc., if they want him. Um, he starts warning them, and in addition to warning the people that they're going to be destroyed, he has a special warning against whom? Noah. King Noah. He said his life will be like a, a what? A garment in the fire. It'll be consumed and st destroyed so completely. So the priests go to the king and represent that Abinadi had said what? that he had threatened the life of the king, you see, that he was, and that of course is, uh, is a very serious crime in any country. You threaten the life of the president, that carries about a 10, ten, year, um, ten year penalty. <laughs> okay. First they threw him into prison. Uh, they brought him before King Abinadi, or excuse me, King Noah, but King Noah couldn't think of all the things he wanted to um, accuse him of. In fact, he's very slow-witted. This king is kind of schizophrenic, you'll notice. He goes back and forth. He first wants to save Abinadi, then he wants to kill him, and then he wants to save him, then he wants to kill him, and so forth. So they, they brought him up to question him. Uh, he put him in prison first so they could think up the questions. He got all the priests together. They think up a good series of questions. They bring him out. And as he began denouncing the king and the people, they got real angry at Abinadi, and they charged him, you know, kill him right on the spot can't say things, bad things about our people and about our king. That's treasonable. And all of a sudden he said what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't come any closer if I were you. I'm broadcasting. And it says his face, face all lighted up exactly like that of what? Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai. And as he came down from Mount Sinai, not the first time, but the second time, uh, that is, uh, after the first plates were destroyed and he went back up to God and he came down again to talk to the people who had been so 
uh, wicked the Lord wanted to destroy them and Moses had had to plead in their behalf he comes down and they, they dare to look at him because what they kept turning their faces away from him he said what's the matter with you listen to me now he said you're too bright can't watch you can't see you he's all transfigured so what did he do what did Moses do he put a veil over his face so he could talk to them isn't that kind of interesting he had to actually put a veil over his face all right now this is the way this man is and he gives almost all the rest of his presentation to them with uh, with glory with his face uh, illuminated like that of Moses of old apparently they he was pretty bright but they looked at him anyway in fact that's the ironical part about it after he gets through condemning them confounding them uh, trapping them actually in a dialogue which is just uh, exciting to read and the power of God goes out of him do they still charge him yeah they do and then what they do to him burned him alive beat him to death with burning faggots and uh, burned him at the stake so you know that uh, they were not only beating on him but there were flames all around him etc what was the um, well let's go back a little bit what was the passage of scripture that they used to try and trap Abinadi? It's out of Isaiah 11. It's uh, The tabernacle choir sings it all, all the time. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bringeth good tidings, uh, that publisheth peace. Isn't that beautiful? And so they want to know what it meant. He says, what do you mean? You're the priest. You, you don't know what that means? You know what that means? He said, by the way, what are you teaching people anyway? What they say they were teaching? Law of Moors. So uh, it, it was interesting how he could have trapped them right on the spot. But he took a little time to trap them gently. And so he asked them why they weren't living the Law of Moses. He said, how does salvation then come? What did they say? Once again, he had them trapped. The law, law of Moses will never save you. Neither will the word of wisdom, nor tithing. All that it does is make you what? Eligible for the application of the atonement and the blotting out process of uh, the Savior's sacrifice. That's what saves us. If it just, I'll tell you, once you know the gospel and what's underneath it, you, you really learn to love your Savior. He becomes personal with you. All of a sudden you realize what the father and the son went through, the anguish they went through to try and set this up so we could come back, having overcome the demands of justice, we could come back to the presence of the father. You really learn to love them. And you can really get on your knees and say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for your son and all that both of you did for me. All of a sudden it becomes very personal to you. That's the beauty of the gospel. There are lots of people that say the words mouth the phrases and really don't know what the gospel is all about so it's learning to love the Savior and understand what they did what he, the, he and the Father did that really makes the gospel come alive now then um, the story of Abinadi is beautiful um, much of his message uh, is built around the 53rd chapter of Isaiah what's that about what's the 53rd chapter of Isaiah the coming of Christ, the only chapter in the entire Old Testament that the Jewish scribes didn't rip out about the first coming. They thought it was a myth. That's why they were going to kill Lehi, because he tried to teach the doctrine that Zenos did, and Zenoch, and Nehem, and Isaiah. So he tried to kill him. But they missed the 53rd chapter. I told you re uh, formerly why we think they left it in. Do you remember? How'd they happen to leave in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah? Yeah, they thought it was the history of Israel going down and coming back up again rather than a man being killed and being resurrected they missed it but now we use it to help the Jewish people find their way into the church and we show them that Jesus was the Christ and Zechariah said when he appears to your people most of them are going to be very surprised because he's got holes in his hands and his feet and your Jewish prophets said when they see him the second time and he comes in glory, they'll say, what are these wounds in thy hands and thy feet? And he'll say, these are the wounds I received in the house of my friends. And then all Judea will go into mourning. So we say to our Jewish brothers and sisters, don't you postpone it until then. Know your Savior now. Know your Messiah now. Are the Jews today expecting a divine Messiah? What are they expecting? 
a great politician to arise. Will a great politician arise? Right. What will be his name? David. Who will he be a descendant of? The original King David. Will he be righteous or wicked? And he'll build what? The temple and prepare the people for the second coming. And you would have thought that would have converted all the Jews by then. But apparently it doesn't because when Jesus actually comes in power, the real Messiah ben David, maybe people will be surprised that he has holes in his hands and his feet. The scars of those wounds. So obviously they won't have been converted before then. We assume so, but we don't know really. Uh, at, some to at some point he becomes a member of the church. Uh, he'll have the assistance of two uh, Mormon Jews as prophets to hold back uh, Gog and Magog with the uh, curtains of fire seen by John the Revelator and spoken of in the 45th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. And you'd think that that would convert him if nothing else did. If, but even if he and a few are converted, apparently the masses of the people will not. And half of them will be killed. Half the Jews will be killed. It will be a real terrible purging. It will be just like the Nephites got it and the Lamanites got it at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Armageddon will be a real trial and a tribulation to them. Now, I want to share something with you just before I turn uh, the class over to you for questions. It's in the 26th chapter of 3rd Nephi that we'll be talking about next um, semester. I want to tell you something real exciting. It's the 26th chapter, verses 8 to 10. 8 to 10. And the related passages are Doctrine and Covenants, 84, 54 to 57. 54 to 57. Now, Mormon was writing this book. You see, have you noticed when you're reading this, see, it's kind of brand new to you. Every once in a while you say, well, my brain is getting so clogged up. I just can't get this. This is just too complicated. I, I just know I can't get this. And then you say, but I got to get it. I have a test Thursday. So you slug away, you know, and you take Brother Skousen's name in vain two or three times or all this terrible detail that we've got to keep in mind. All right. Now let me tell you, let me share a great ambition that I have for you. It's in this 26th chapter of 3rd Nephi. Mormon was just going to unload a whole mountain of knowledge in this book. And the Lord says, no, Mormon. No. You've told him enough. Now listen to Mormon talking. Behold the plates of Nephi, this is the seventh verse. Behold the plates of Nephi do contain the more part of the things which Jesus taught the people. And these things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people. In other words, in my abridged plates, I haven't written uh, much of what Jesus taught. And I have written them to the intent that they may be brought again unto this people from the Gentiles, meaning the, the Lamanites and their descendants, from the Gentiles who, from whom we came, according to the words which Jesus had spoken. And when they shall have received this, meaning the Gentiles and the Lamanites in modern times, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, if it shall so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them unto their condemnation. Now, hold that in your mind. Let me flip over to 84 and you listen to the Lord talking to the early members of the church. And what he said to them still applies to us. And it's just terrible that we've allowed this to get away from us. Listen to this. The beginning of the 54th verse. Your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you have treated lightly the things you have received, which vanity, in assuming that you already knew everything, and unbelief have brought the whole church under, under condemnation. And this condemnation rested upon the children of Zion, even all the members of the church. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember what? The new covenant of the Book of Mormon. 
and all these things I have re revealed. All the other commandments. Now, do you want the big plates of Nephi? You can have them. I can promise you that in the name of God that you can have them. We just need one generation of Latter-day Saints that will make themselves worthy of that promise. And God does not lie. You can have the large plates of Nephi. How thrilling it would be to go to a general conference and have President Lee or his successor say, my brothers and sisters, good news. For 18 months I have labored in the temple by day and by night to share with you the whole record of the ministry of Christ to the Nephites. We now have the large plates of Nephi translated into English. Now you can have that. So when you're struggling with your text, will you remember that? Brother Skousen isn't trying to make your life at college tough for you. And he isn't trying to fail you. He's just trying to get you to qualify, which my generation did not, for the large plates of Nephi. It has taken me eight years to prepare this text that you're now reading, the four volumes, two for each semester. And they seem a little long, I'm sure, and a little tedious maybe sometimes, but I've tried to load into them these pearls of great price that God has shared with us so that you can be the generation that when somebody says uh, Malachi, you say, oh yes, or Benadi, I'm all about Benadi. Oh, Ammon, yes, there were several Ammons. Which one do you want to know about? Or the city of uh, Shemlon. You know where Shemlon was? Oh, of course I know where Shemlon was. See? I want you to be that generation. That's all you have to do to qualify for the large plates of Nephi. Now, don't forget those passages. And when you're asked to give your next two and a half minute talk, will you do that? Will you refer them to chapter 26 of 3rd Nephi, beginning with verse 7, really, rather than 8, and then sh uh, uh, ship them across over to the modern statement of God that the church is under that condemnation. 84, beginning with 54. So that's an easy way to remember it. 84, beginning with 54, up to 57. Those are just great passages. Let me share one other thing with you. How many of you make it a habit of taking all four of your standard works to church with you every Sunday, every time you go to a meeting? That is just great. That's ten times more than we used to have. Nobody took them to church. All right, so now will the rest of you kind of get in a habit? Take your scriptures to church. Now when you get them there, don't just hold them in your hand, your patty hand. During sacrament, turn to... Uh, the last part of, uh, of um, 26 and 27 of Matthew and so forth. Read about the crucifixion of the Savior. A speaker is up there and he'll say, Now, my brothers and sisters, in the opening verses of the 11th chapter of the book of Isaiah, it says, <sighs> Boy, and, it, and it always helps. I don't know how you are, but I got the index. Uh, <laughs> because I, I can find it faster. Now, uh, Brother Andrews, he just loves to have no indexes in his book and almost by braille, he can turn to it. But it's faster for me. I flip my books all the time, but I like to be able to hit that index and flip it open. Eleven. <laughs> he quoted it right. Uh, but do that. Then you will remember uh, the opening verses of chapter 11 of Isaiah. See, this is the way you impress it on your brain. And he'll say, now the great last sermon of the Savior before he was crucified was given in the 24th chapter of Matthew. <laughs> oh, that's the one when he told about coming the second time. The disciples said, when do you come in power and glory? He said, let me give you the signs. There they are. It's all about our day. A lot of it. Now that's what you get used to doing. Somebody quotes the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. What's that about? The coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ, that's right. And you get so that's very familiar with you, to you, right? Any final questions now before Tuesday, or Thursday? Who was the king who put Ammon in jail? Yeah, what's, what's the name of the king that put Ammon in jail? Limhi, right, okay? Limhi.